Hello, everyone. This is Jim Ransom with another episode of Morning Jim Poetry. This is for the weekend of 24 March, and I'm going to call it The Great War Revisited. What Americans called the First World War was called the Great War by the British and all their colonial troops. It was a war that should not have been fought. We can say that about others as well. It was a willy-nilly war brought on by pre-existing treaties and bad diplomacy. Um, and it shocked the world because we had a lot of new weapons, more powerful artillery. We had aircraft for the first time in warfare. And casualties were vast. In just one battle on the River Somme in France, lasting from July 1st to mid-November of 1916, 482,000 British troops were killed or wounded, and French casualties exceeded 250,000. <coughs> the Germans lost over 235,000. Just think of that. The total there of all those three countries um, was about a million dead and wounded. And that was in just one year. On the very first day of the offensive, total British casualties were 57,470. 19,240 of these men were killed outright. Such carnage in single battles has seldom, perhaps never, been seen before or since. It, it is a wonder that the poetry in the Victorian mode is is it, is it any wonder that the poetry of the Victorian era was buried in the Great War? A new way of versification came forward, often brutally realistic and full of sadness. The great poets such as Wilfred Owen and Siegfried Sassoon, whom we covered a few months ago, uh, brought that to the fore. But sometimes it seems that almost everyone who fought in that war, wrote poetry. I'm exaggerating, but um, here's a book that is of fairly recent publication called The International Poetry of the First World War. And look how thick it is. It's over, and let me look here, uh, it's almost 400 pages long. And uh, it is very good in that it has explanatory notes about almost every poet and, and every poem, um, which makes it a lot more fun to read and, um, and more understandable, I think, by far. Anyway... <clears throat> Out of that book, I've picked a few poems which I think are worth hearing. <clears throat> Although they're all worth hearing, but for the short time that we have, these poems will be um, ideal. First of all is a poem called The Face by Frederick Manning. Manning served in at least two British brigades, and he survived the war, which was not true of some of the other poets that I'm going to read. Um, <clears throat> this poem is called The Face. Out of the smoke of men's wrath, the red mist of anger, suddenly, as a wraith of sleep, a boy's face, white and tense, convulsed with terror and hate, the lips trembling, then a red smear falling, I thrust aside the cloud as it were tangible, blinded with a mist of blood, the face cometh again as a wraith of sleep, a boy's face, delicate and blonde, the very mask of God, broken. Frederick Manning was a very good writer and deserves probably um, more commentary in some of the books. 
I now another poet that I came across. His name was Patrick McGill, and um, this poem is from his book Soldier Songs, published after the war. And this one's entitled "Sing Me to Sleep." Sing me to sleep where bullets fall. Let me forget the war and all. Damp is my dugout, cold my feet, nothing but bully and biscuits to eat. Over the sandbags, helmets, you'll find corpses in front and corpses behind. And then there's a chorus. Far, far from Eeps I long to be, where German snipers can't get at me. Think of me crouching where the worms creep, waiting for the sergeant to sing me to sleep. Sing me to sleep in some old shed, the rats all running around my head, stretched out upon my waterproof, dodging the raindrops through the roof, dreaming of home and nights in the West. Somebody's overseas boots on my chest. That's kind of how it was in that war, folks. Um, and um, we see a lot of poems along those lines, realistic, hard-hitting, um, concise, and sometimes sad and bitter. Um, here's a poem by Francis Ledwidge. Francis Ledwidge was kind of an interesting character. He was an Irish nationalist, but he enlisted in the British Army in October of 1914, um, thinking that he would be able to further the cause of Irish home rule if, he, if the British Army could just win this war. So <clears throat> he fought. He fought at Gallipoli and was injured in Serbia. And he was known as the poet of the blackbird. Ledwidge lived to see only one volume of his poetry published, Songs of the Fields. And, um, uh, and, and then he, uh, he uh, spoke out against the Easter Rising, and was uh, court-martialed. But because the British were very short of troops, and he was a good soldier, um, he was um, he was let go if he was willing to go back to fight, and he was. And um, he returned to the Western Front. Um, in the events of the First World War and Easter Rising uh, intensified his allegiance to Ireland, and um, he <clears throat> wrote a letter to the Irish poet Catherine Tinnan. If I survive the war, I have great hopes of writing something that will live. If not, I trust to be remembered in my own land for one or two things which is long sorrow inspired. Um, Francis Ledwidge didn't make it through the war. On July 31st, 1917, the first day of the Battle of Passchendaele, he and five other men of the Royal in Inniskilling Fusiliers were killed by a stray artillery shell probably British or French, which landed behind the lines. His grave is only steps away from that of the Welch Port head Wynne, who also died that day. So let's hear this poem um, by Francis Ledwidge. It's called... <clears throat> um, Uh, two, if I can find it here, two, one dead. 
A blackbird singing on a moss upholstered stone. Bluebells swinging, shadows wildly blown. A song in the wood, a ship on the sea. The song was for you, and the ship was for me. A blackbird singing, I hear in my troubled mind. Bluebells swinging, I see in a distant wind. But sorrow and silence are the wood's threnody, the silence for you, and the sorrow for me. Yeah, that was a sad poem and a sad outcome to the poet's life. Um, <clears throat> but he, he did get published, and he's still remembered to this day for his work. Let me read you another brief a poem which I think gives a sharp focus to the nature of the war. This is by a British soldier named Joseph Lee, um, and he revisits memories of men who died at his hands. It's entitled The Bullet. Every bullet has its billet, many bullets more than one. God! Perhaps I killed a mother when I killed a mother's son. And then finally, for today's session, is a poem by Margaret Sackville, who was not a soldier in the war, but she was a leading, uh, a leader of the women's pacifist organizations, were, who grew up during the war and became very, uh, powerful, but only temporarily so, after the war was over. Um, <clears throat> reconciliation. When all the stress and all the toil is over, and my lover lies sleeping by your lover, with alien earth on hands and brows and feet, then we may meet. Moving sorrowfully, with uneven paces, the bright sun shining on our ravaged faces. There, very quietly, without sound or speech, each shall greet each. We, who are bound by the same grief forever, when all our sons are dead, may talk together, each asking pardon from the other one for her dead son. With such low, tender words the heart may fashion, broken and few of pity and compassion, knowing that we disturb at every tread our mutual dead. Um, so, um, uh, Margaret Sackville was a very well accomplished poet of the First World War. And I think you can tell from that poem that that the events of the First World War were such that the um, lyricism and joy of the Victorian era eh, couldn't continue in the poetic field. Um, <clears throat> so that's it for today. We've had a taste of some of the letter, lesser known poets of the Great War. And um, Mar Margaret Sackville became a leader among pacifists, pacifists at the time. But unfortunately, <clears throat> Hitler was already walking among the Germans. And the First World War, which was supposed to be the Great War to end all wars, uh, didn't do its job. And we had the Second World War uh, in 1939 and thereafter joined by the United States um, after the Japanese burnt, after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor in 1941. We'll carry on with some other poetry, maybe some happier poetry, next week. But for now, 
Um, don't get discouraged. Keep reading poetry. It's the great, satisfying literary um, mode of all ages. And I'll see you next week. Bye now.